seems to be a big changeover now. So, um, but I will start by once again welcoming you to the Martha's Vineyard Book Festival, and reminding you um, that there is food available for sale. It is just about lunchtime. Um, so there's food from the Orange Peel Bakery, Mary's Lemonade, the Scottish Bakehouse, Chef Dion Catering, and Chef Amy Johnson's food truck. So please support these food vendors. Also, we're also grateful to have our authors here. And so please um, help support the festival by buying their books um, over in the book tent. And um, finally, um, we'll have a little Q&A at the end of this, I think. Yep. So we have a Q and A. There's there's a microphone. I didn't see it from here, but it's there. So please go to the microphone when when the time comes. So I'm going to quickly get to an introduction of Rita Braver, um, who it, uh, will be our interviewer in this um, session. Rita is a nine-time Emmy Award winner and national correspondent for CBS News's CBS Sunday Morning, where she reports on everything from arts and culture to politics and foreign policy. She's interviewed presidents, cabinet secretaries, and celebrities, and reported on topics ranging from the assassination of Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin to the Clinton White House to the rise of political correctness on campus. So with that, I will turn it over to Rita. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. Is that better? Oh yeah, that's better. Um, and, and thank you to all the great volunteers, these people, somebody was, very confused who was trying to help us into a parking lot. And I said to Bob, you know, I bet he's like an investment banker who makes $5 million a year. And he has no idea how to park a car, but he's trying. Um, so for those of you who don't know, and, and you know, I did an earlier session. Bob just did a session. And I'm sorry if you're tired of us. I can't blame you. Um, and, and for those of you who are here, thank you very much. Um, but for those of you who don't know, Bob Barnett is a senior partner at the uh, famed law firm of Williams and Connolly. Um, and Edward Bennett Williams, the founder of the firm, had a place on Martha's Vineyard for many years, so it kind of comes full circle. Um, he represents all kinds of clients on both civil and criminal matters. Um, you should probably read his resume. It's very impressive. I'm not going to list it all here. He represents many people in television, producers, correspondents, including me. And did I mention that I'm his wife? I should say that. Um, I like to think of myself as his favorite client, but I never ask him because I don't really want to know. Um, but I can warn you right now that this is probably not going to be a hostile interview because I'm going to be traveling with him for the rest of the week, and I want it to go well. Um, but the main reason that we're here today is that Bob has represented some 350 authors over the course of the years. And have you read every single one of the books of the authors that you've published? I haven't always read the children's books, but I think I've read all the adult books. Um, we're talking about politics and publishing. And I think it's fair to say that you, in a way, got into the field of publishing because you helped Geraldine Ferraro, who was Walter Mondale's running mate and, of course, the first woman to be on a national ticket, um, with her book. How did that happen, and what inspired you to go into publishing? Ben Heinemann, sitting right here, and I were asked by Walter Mondale in 1984, along with a little-known professor at Georgetown, to do the foreign policy work. Her name was Madeleine Albright to prepare Jerry Ferraro for the vice presidential debate. And Jerry was a three-term congresswoman from Queens, and he was ambassador to China, UN ambassador, congressman, head of the RNC, Bush 41, CIA, absolutely. And Ben and I and Madeline and a couple others did that job, and I still believe to this day, at worst, it was a tie. She did great. 
And after they lost, she was still the hottest thing around, first woman, beautiful, smart, funny. And so at that time, there were all kinds of publishers. Now they're all conglomeratized. But there were 23 separate publishers that wanted to publish her book. So I hired an agent, and because I didn't know anything about publishing, and we did the book, and it was the largest advance to that time ever paid for a memoir. It's been exceeded since. And when I saw this, I said, I can do this, and to me, it didn't make sense to pay a 15% commission to do this. So when David Stockman, you remember David Stockman, uh, who was taken to the woodshed by Ronald Reagan, when he left, I auditioned to be the representative. He'd been the budget director. Been the well. budget director, yep. And I did it on an hourly fee basis, as I do my other legal work, not on a commission basis. And David, who was very interested in saving money, uh, hired me. And we set then what was the record, beating Ferraro's advance. And then I'd done one Republican, one Democrat. And so I started doing book deals on uh, an hourly fee basis. And then James Patterson, the greatest number one selling fiction author in history, also seeing a bargain as against paying a commission, came to me, and uh, he does, we just recently did a 22 book deal, which will last two years. He does 12 a year. And so do the math, uh, you save a lot of money. And so I started doing these book deals, a lot of fun, got the chance to meet people like Jim Acosta and Admiral McRaven, who you heard earlier, and I've done three presidents, I've done six secretaries of state, seven treasury secretaries, Mary Higgins Clark, Khalid Hosseini, a lot of fiction writers. So I started doing book deals. Um, and I guess it's worked out pretty well. Yeah. Uh, I, I was going to ask you, in fact, the question that you answered about why people um, would go to you, but sometimes people do seem to feel that they need the security of a book agent and that that agent somehow uh, has a road into the publishing world that you don't have. And in fact, sometimes you think for certain kinds of authors that that's correct. Yeah, I, I do the same thing that an agent does with three exceptions. First, I charge on an hourly fee basis, not a commission basis. Second, I'm bound by legal ethics, and I'll leave it at that. Third. Uh, if the client wishes, I plan the rollout. So when Nikki Haley's book comes out in October, you'll see her on a variety of shows, variety of print interviews, cable, network, radio, uh, with the publisher and with her own people, I plan that. Uh, I don't make any sense for a first time novelist from Vermont. Please don't send me your first novels. I make no sense for first novels. I only make sense for the large advance books where I can do whatever I do to get the very best deal, but also charge you way less than you would have to pay if you were paying a 15% agent. So I don't make sense for new writers. Goodness, I support them, and Jim Patterson has an imprint to support them that we help set up, but I only make sense for the bigger books where what I do has an advantage. We're, we're gonna talk more about the political books, but you've also done a lot of finance and business books. And in particular, you recently did Phil Knight's book about the founding of Nike Shoe Dog. What's it like working with those people? And is it different, um, how shall I put this diplomatically, to work with people who have really achieved something maybe more concrete than many politicians can point to? Yeah, I love doing business books. Uh, one of the first ones I did was Ben's old boss, Jack Welsh. Did, I think, three books with him. Uh, Phil Knight, I guess people say he's one of the ten richest men in the world, uh, he had a hell of a story to tell. The founding of Nike, and it's not a corporate history, it's about he and a 300 pound lawyer and a, a track coach and Steve Prefontaine, the great runner, and a couple others, came up with this idea and fought literally the US government, their parents, the banks, on and on and on to create this worldwide behemoth, Nike. And it's almost, it reads like a novel, and it's full of great stories. And 
getting to work with those people, like Jack Welsh, like Phil, I've got a couple coming in the fall that I'll mention, uh, is a real treat because it's the insights you gain from them and watching them work, they're all very different. They all have certain ways they do things. They have standards that they apply, and I learn an awful lot from it. I've got two coming in the fall. Frank Bennick, name you don't know, but you probably know Hearst Corporation, which is magazines and television stations and Fitch Ratings. He's the guy who for 30 years ran Hearst, one of the biggest private companies in America. Uh, Joe Ricketts, you probably don't know that name. He changed the way we trade stocks. He invented Ameritrade, where you could trade a stock for a small commission, not go through the big brokers. He sold it to TD Bank, and now, interestingly, he owns the Chicago Cubs, but he also has a, a conservation foundation that's saving loons and swans. He has a um, art foundation that's saving all the original Western art. Now, Joe and I could not be further apart politically. He is an always Trumper, not an ever Trumper, but an always Trumper. I am not. Um, but learning from him and his business philosophies and the way he created literally a new industry, much like Phil did with shoes, is fascinating to me. Those are two coming in talk, the fall. Talk a little bit. I mean, one interesting example was Ken Langone, who no one expected his book to sell anything, including him. He just wanted to write it. What happened? Yeah, well, there, there's the vicissitudes of publishing. Ken Langone founded Home Depot. You all know Home Depot. You probably don't know Ken Langone. Ken um, is an amazing character. We first ran into him when we represented the head of the New York Stock Exchange. You'll remember when Spitzer and Cuomo were after him, and, and Ken was involved in that. So we represented him in that context. And he had a, I knew he had a great story, because I'd spent hours with him and learned the stories. And we said, let's do the book. So he said, OK, and he didn't think it would do anything. I sent it to Peggy Noonan, who I knew loved entrepreneurs. You've read her column. You've seen how many times she read. And she wrote a column. And it went to number five on Amazon the next hour. And it proceeded to go to the New York Times bestseller list and have a big sale. So you just never know. Peggy Noonan made that book happen. Um, Read a show, CBS Sunday Morning. When they do a piece on a book, it almost invariably goes to the top five or ten on Amazon within two hours. There are certain triggers because viewers read, uh, uh, readers view and readers read Peggy Noonan and CBS Sunday Morning, and they drive the books up. So there's certain ways that you promote books. Admiral McRaven, it, go look on the website. Fabulous piece by David Martin on CBS Sunday Morning. George Ann will testify. It launched the book right to the I'm top I'm recused five. from getting she's those recused. done. I'm recused. Yeah, she's recused. Um, but I want to ask you about that since we're talking about it. Most um, agents or authors' representatives don't seem to get involved in what I think people call the rollout. How, you know, there's a book. It can be a great book. How do people find out about it? Why have you decided that that's going to be part of the service that you offer? Yeah, I, I have the blessing of representing a lot of people in the media. My wife is my favorite client. Let me say that for the record. Um, and so I'm into the media, and I have a feel for which anchors, which writers, which radio hosts are going to likely be most interested in a given book. So if you have a business book, the holy grail is Marketplace with Kai Rizdow. Um, uh, if you have a business book, the holy grail is uh, uh, Power Lunch on CNBC or Neil Cavuto on Fox. There are certain places you go with these books. And over the years, both representing media people, representing authors, living with someone who's been in that business for a year or two, I've gotten a sense of what works. And it's fun, like the people, and if you succeed, you help your author. And you get to go in the green room at Colbert, right? <laughs> go, one of the most fun things I do is go with the clients to Colbert and hang out. Um, there are many kinds of political books, obviously. Uh, memoirs, policy books, others about politics from people who aren't politicians, like you've done almost all of Bob Woodward's books. Um, are there certain things that you can say make a good political book? Well, the 
probably the most successful one I've ever done is one Michelle Obama. We just passed 11 million copies. Think about that, 11 million copies, just North America, 40 countries and languages worldwide. And while that's not by any means a political book, it has politics in it because he was, her husband was twice elected president of the United States and she lived for eight years in the White House. What makes the really good ones are the great stories. Um, the best Secretary of State book probably ever, which I had nothing to do with, it was before I was born, was President of the Creation by Dean Acheson. If you read that, it's great stories. Madeline's book is great stories. Hillary's Secretary of State book, great stories. James Baker's Secretary of State book, while it was really long and his shorter political book, So Better, has also great stories. So the fundamental secret to success with these books is simply making it a great read. Sometimes you have people like Bob Woodward or some of the other reporters that you represent who are writing books, and sometimes they end up writing things that perhaps your cl other clients might not like, might disagree with. How do you walk that line of representing somebody on one hand and somebody else who might write something bad about that person? No, it's a very fair question. If you look at Woodward's books, the last 20, you'll see right in the acknowledgments, he thanks me, which I appreciate. And then he says, because Bob represents several people in this book, he did not read this book until it was printed. And so I stay away from the book if it's in any way touching on a client. When it's not touching on a client, sometimes I do editing, sometimes I make suggestions as to content, and I enjoy doing that. I'm not an editor. There are at this gathering some amazing editors who I hope you'll get the chance to socialize with. I don't pretend to be one, but I enjoy doing that if the client uh, asks and if it doesn't touch on a client. But I, you know, I represent everybody from Barack Obama to Dick Cheney, from Hillary Clinton. I'm interviewing you. You're not to, interviewing to, to yourself. Mitch McConnell. <laughs> we'll, we'll get there. But I want to ask you, while we're still talking about the presidents, you have, you have represented now uh, George W. Bush, Bill Clinton, Barack Obama on working on their memoirs. Give us a little bit of insight into what it's like to interview people, to, to work for three different people who have had what's arguably the most important job in the world in their time, and what are the differences between those individuals and how they wanted things handled? The, uh, for someone from Waukegan, Illinois, having the opportunity to represent three presidents has been pretty thrilling and a real blessing. They're all different. They all have their... Can you hear me? Can you hear me okay? okay yeah. yeah. They all have different aspirations for their books. Uh, Bush 43 came up with a genius concept to not do just a chronological memoir, but 13 decisions. The book's called Decision Points. And that, that had been done before, but never by a president. And so he used those 13 decisions as jumping off for what, in effect, was a memoir, but wasn't just, uh, then I was born and I got the measles and I went to high school. Uh, Barack Obama, who will come out this uh, spring with his presidential memoir, has already written Dreams for My Father, one of the most amazing early life books ever. So unlike Michelle's book, which is a full life, his will just be a presidential memoir. Clinton's was, unfortunately, 1,200 pages. The first half, many people thought, was the most interesting, growing up in Hope and, the, and Virginia Kelly and the fathers and the challenges of Arkansas. And the, the last half, I didn't agree with this, but some people thought was not as interesting. So when we did the, the mass market paperback, we divided it into two books. Uh, so each one has a different aspirations. Each one has a different burden. But and what they, about their personalities? Oh, I mean, I loved working with all three of them. Bill Clinton, I did his debate prep in 92, played Bush in the rehearsals. Um, and so knew him and knew Hillary. Hillary had three offers by Edward Bennett Williams to join our law firm. She turned us down each time. So I knew them well. I didn't really know Obama till he ran for the Senate and he asked me to represent him on the book that became Audacity of Hope, 
but obviously an inspirational and, and amazingly uh, accomplished person. And Bush, I didn't know what to think because goodness knows he wasn't my politics, but let me say he looks better every day. You know, um, you started to get into this and I stopped you, but I think this is a good time. You have represented so many people that you don't agree with their politics. Dick Cheney, Dan Quayle, even more recently, Mitch McConnell. Um, why do you represent politicians with whom you obviously disagree? And I, strongly. I turn down the haters. Um, I turn down, for everyone I do, I turn down 50. Um, I think that each of these people, even though I don't agree with them, have something to say. And for a reason or another, we're part of history. And I think it's good for our grandkids and for all of you who are here and love reading to have the opportunity, if you so choose, if you want to spend $30 or buy the ebook or hear the audio, to read what they have to say. So I tend to take on people that I don't agree with, don't agree with if I think they have something to say and I want to be a part of it. Uh, but it's certainly different to take on people you completely agree with because there you can even be more helpful and weigh in on content. You mentioned that, for example, you don't read Bob Woodward's books in, in draft form. But do you read the drafts of some of your clients' books and offer suggestions or editorial comments or try to make the book better if you're worried that it may, might not be good enough or try to make it shorter if you... Uh, made it too long, although I can think of some of your clients' books that I wish you had made shorter. I, uh, if they wish, I don't intrude, but if they wish, I will read, I will edit, I will give content suggestions, I will give shortening suggestions. Uh, they don't always listen to me. They know I'm not a professional editor. They all have professional editors. They also have their policy advisors and political advisors and everybody else who weighs in. But I love, I love reading the early drafts and giving uh, content suggestions, and if they take them, I'm honored. You, we, we talked a little bit about the presidents and first ladies that you have represented, but when you sell their books, here they are, you know, they have a certain level of dignity or, you know, presidents of the past, first ladies of the past have been known to have a certain amount of dignity, and you are essentially putting them out on the open market. So you have to both protect their dignity and try to get, and I know you do, the maximum bucks for their services. How do you walk that fine line of marketing them and yet keeping them at the level that they wish to be kept? I um, help them identify the right imprints and the right editors to submit to. So I will not, for instance, go to the crazy left or right publishers because they don't serve most clients well. Some they do. Uh, so I try to put them with the right team. Then we have meetings. We don't just submit a written proposal. We have meetings. And I do a briefing memo. I accompany them to the meetings. I prepare them for the meetings. And I try to assess, more importantly, they assess if it's the right fit. These meetings are my, my favorite story about the meetings is when Hillary was first lady and she was going to leave and write what became living history, uh, we had 14 publishers who wanted to meet. Now that's a lot of meetings. Usually it's five or six. And I told her, as I always tell the clients, you got to come into these meetings with five great stories that aren't in the proposal that are either funny or tragic or inspirational or whatever. And you can tell the same stories because I'm the only one in all the meetings. So I don't care. So we go to 14 meetings and Hillary, being Hillary, had five different stories for each of 14 meetings. And we had 60 stories and the book was done. That doesn't usually happen. Uh, they want to judge if you're a storyteller. And they want to judge if you have stories to tell. And so those meetings are critically important. So between the, I think, proper selection of the target publishers and the meeting process, 
we try to get to the right place with each of these partnerships. And sometimes it becomes a life partnership, and they do 10 books, uh, not just one. You weren't personally involved in it, but Michelle Obama went out and did paid events around her book in huge arenas around the country with interviewers who he, she chose, bringing in a lot of money. She got really good reviews on them. Do you think that that's the start of a trend that now former politicians, and, and look, we all know, former politicians have gone out and spoken to select groups, business groups, and made money, but now this has become open to the public. Do you think that's a wave of the future, or do you think that Michelle Obama is just one of a kind? There is no one like Michelle Obama. I don't see anybody, maybe President Obama, but I don't think he'll go about it that way. I don't see anybody who could fill 30, 40,000 feet of uh, seat arenas in dozens of cities. She is truly unique. The rules don't apply. 11 million copies is a testament to the fact that the rules don't apply. And she wrote a great book. How many of you read her book? It's, I would argue, I'm, I'm biased, I think it's a really great book. When can we expect President Obama's book? This spring. Okay. Um, it's taken him a while. He wants to write a great book. <laughs> Um, you mentioned that you do turn down what you call the haters. What does it take for you to turn down a book on ideological grounds? Yeah, I don't want to be, you're not asking me to, I don't want to name names, but you all know who the haters are, and you probably, many of you would share my judgment as to who they are. Um, I, I, I've done this long enough, really since 1984, that I can sort of spot where these things are going and what these authors are seeking to proliferate. And it's a subjective judgment. There are no rules. But I, I know uh, people I don't want to work with. And I, it's hard, but you say no, and you try to do it in a constructive and, and friendly way. Not always easy, but you, you try to make your choices. I've also been at many events in Washington where people come up to you, it's often wives, and they say something like, my husband left government or left Congress 20 years ago, and I've been trying to get him to write a book all this time, and he's finally agreed, and he wants you to sell it. And then I just see kind of your whole body collapse. And How do you deal with that? You know what I always mm -hmm. say. You know what I always say. I look at her and I say, too much sex and violence, <laughs> and I walk away. I never hear from the guy again. You also, you also get, and I, and I love what you tell people, you also get many people who come up to you, not necessarily political books, but people who, and look, all of us believe our lives are important, and many of us think our lives would make a great book, and people come up all the time and say to you, everybody says I should write a book. And I say, are any of them publishers? <laughs> and that's the end of that conversation. So if any of you come up to me, that's what you're going to hear. Um, are there any books that you, and I, you probably don't want to name them, but does it ever happen that there is a book that you had really high hopes for and it just doesn't end up doing very well? Uh, I, I've been, I'm not going to get into the economics of publishing. These, but in shorthand, these books get big advances. And those big advances seldom earn out, what's called earn out by royalties. But the publisher can make money even if the advance doesn't earn out. Why? The author gets a 15% royalty on the cover price. So for a $30 book, the author gets $450. But the publisher gets the difference between the wholesale price of the book and the cost of the trees and the ink. So they're making maybe $8, $9 where the earnout calculation is 450. Happily, I've only had uh, three, four books where the publisher has not, the big ones, where the publisher has not made money. So that makes me happy because I want my client to make money and I would love it if we leave the experience with the publisher making money. A few years ago, there were all of these predictions. I even did a story on it. People saying publishing as we know it was gonna be gone in a couple of years. That hasn't happened. Why do you think that is? 
happily, there's still people who want to read, who want to experience adventure, who want shared experiences, who want to be entertained by thrills. Um, the ebook was going to be the death of publishing, but it's kind of leveled off at 40, 50 percent. Now the biggest thing going is audio. Audio is back. Michelle Obama's book has been number one. It's been on the list, I think, 37 weeks this Sunday, but it's been number one on the audio list forever because she reads the book, and you can literally listen to her tell you the story of her life. So audios have come back. Um, Amazon has made a profound impact on publishing, and that's a whole other seminar we won't get into. But happily, the independents are coming back slowly, small numbers, but they're opening again, and they're expanding, and they're branching. So the demise of publishing hasn't happened. I still fear for it, uh, because unless we encourage our kids and grandkids to read, there, there will be nobody to buy the books. So please do that. That's why you're here, I'm sure. We're going to go to the questions. I have one more for you, though. Um, and I know it's probably like asking you to name your favorite grandchild, but... After all these years, do you have a favorite author, favorite client who's an author? Yes. Um, there was a little boy named Matty Stepanek. Matty was, when I first met him, about seven years old. He had muscular dystrophy. He had lost three siblings to muscular dystrophy. His mom had muscular dystrophy. His father had abandoned him. Um, he was in a children's hospital dying, and one of these groups came to him and, and granted three wishes. And his wishes were to get his poems published, to be on Oprah, and to meet Jimmy Carter. Um, a little publisher, this, this child, I, his books are all called Heart Songs. They're still on Amazon. He was six, seven years old. He wrote, if there, I often said to Rita, if there was such a thing as an angel on earth, Matty Stepanek was that angel. He wrote adult thoughtful, beautiful poetry as a little kid. And so a little publisher, I had nothing to do with this, a little publisher in Arlington ran off a series of his poems and little pamphlets. So he got wish number one, he got his books published. Oprah read about it. He was on Oprah, so he got wish number two. Oprah called me, said, could you help him? I did him a seven-figure, five-book deal, all of which made the New York Times bestseller list. And when he was on GMA with Diane Sawyer to promote the third book, we got Jimmy Carter to surprise him. So he got all three. And, uh, when he died, both Oprah and Jimmy Carter spoke at his funeral. So I, I recommend it. Maddie Stepanek, Heart Songs, the most amazing author I've represented. Questions? Can you uh, speak into the mic or can somebody tilt the mic down for it? Bob Woodward's last book, as compared to the others, did it peak too fast? Is it my imagination it has not done that well? Did it peak too fast? Oh, what? sold 2.3 million copies. It was the number two nonfiction book of 2018. So it, it's okay. Oh, huge. Yeah. Interesting. No, only Michelle Obama beat him. No, he was number two oh, of really? 2018. Okay. That was a huge seller. One of the biggest sellers he's had in a few years. And I hope he'll write another one. Good afternoon. Could you comment on more current events, such as, I know you've done a lot of debate prep, uh, but the current debates that have taken place and your thoughts about them? Yeah, I've, uh, since 1976, I've worked on 10 cycles, uh, often playing the Republican or, and or being on the team. Uh, from Clinton, Obama, all the, I've done 42 debates with Hillary, counting Senate and primaries. Um, I'm very worried. Uh, we're off the record, if there are any journalists here. Uh, uh, I'm very worried uh, because I fear that we Democrats, through this process so far, are hurting each other more than we're hurting the incumbent on the other side. When it comes down to criticizing Barack Obama, who has a 97% approval rating among Democrats, there's something wrong with that. I don't pretend to have the solution. I wish we would be looking forward more than backwards. I wish we'd look at shared goals more than the detailed plans on how to get there. And I worry how we will reconcile what is a deep cleavage in the party 
between the more progressives and the more moderates. I believe you need aspirational goals. But I also believe that there's a big part of the electorate, probably the decisive part of the electorate, that's going to want to know a way to get there. And so therein lies the tension. And how that will, there's going to be 10 more of these, so there's a long way to go. And people will rise and fall and rise and fall. But I hope we can unify and I hope we can present a united front with aspirational goals, practical plans, such that we can make a change. I, I hope that. Is there going to be a, a George McGovern type nominee? No, I don't think so. I think there's enough, I hope, and I, I'm the guy who did Hillary's debate prep and we were talking last night, she won all three debates decisively, but it didn't matter. Um, I think that there's enough dissatisfaction with the incumbent that what we tried to do in 16 on the Hillary campaign, which was disqualify him, not talk probably enough about what we were for, although we did. New York Times failed to cover it because they were more interested in emails. Um, and I'm not bitter. <laughs> the, uh, I hope that this time there will be sufficient dissatisfaction with what Jim Acosta talked about with Rita earlier, 10,000 lies, that we won't have to do as much of that and we will have more time to do the positive case for our side. Time will tell. I don't know. I, I worked on the Mondale campaign in 84, but I also worked on the Carter campaign in 76, and nobody thought that would come to be. So you just never know. With respect to the uh, celebrity books that you're involved in, uh, politicians, business people, and the like, would you talk a little bit about co-writers and ghostwriters? Yeah. Um, good question. James Patterson is a perfect example. Jim does, I mentioned earlier, 12 a year. He writes the Alex Crosses himself. He writes um, the nonfictions himself. And as to most of the others, not all, but most of the others, he has a collaborator. Collaborators are fully acknowledged with type as big as Jim's name. He doesn't hide it. But he does a 50, 60, 70 page outline of every chapter, every character development, and, and the whole flow of the thing. He gives that to the collaborator. The collaborator does a first draft, and then he makes it his own by rewriting it six, seven, eight times. So uh, while he uses collaborators, he, he still makes them his own. On the nonfiction side, it's a whole, that's fiction. Nonfiction side, it's different. Uh, Barack Obama wrote dreams, is writing, you know, they write their own books. Others use collaborators. They use them in different ways. Um, some use them as sounding boards. Ask me the hard questions, we'll tape it, and then we'll do a draft together. Others use it as a first draft. Others use it much like an editor. So every person uses a collaborator in a different way. Quick story. When I did Ali North's book after Iran-Contra, he used a guy named Bill Novak. Bill Novak is probably the most successful collaborator in publishing history. He did Lee Iacocca and Sharansky and Nancy Reagan and amazing. And we were doing the criminal case. My partner Brendan Sullivan and the team were doing the criminal case. So we didn't want the draft to get subpoenaed by the prosecutors, be put on the public record, and there goes the book. So every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, Ali checked into a ground floor room at the Marriott at Dulles Airport. Uh, excuse me, Bill Novak checked into a ground floor room at the Marriott at Dulles. And every day at 9 a.m. in full combat, face paint and everything, Ali snuck in the window, worked all day, and snuck out. And that's how they wrote the book. And we kept Knowing Ali, he just wanted to do that. He just wanted to do it that way. <laughs> and we kept it secret until the room service waiter got suspicious because Novak always ordered two lunches. <laughs> and then the room service... Waiter threw us under the bus. There could be some urban legend in this. I'm just saying. Uh, I think we have time probably for one more question because this is supposed to end at 11:15. So there you are. The reservation regarding impeachment. Sorry. Can you hear me now? The reservation regard. <laughs> the reservation regarding impeachment is the 1998 precedent of the results of the uh, the election, uh, the congressional election. So the concern now is that you'd have 20 to 30 exurban and suburban districts that would go back from blue to red were there impeachment here. 
What is wrong with uh, Jerry Nadler conducting hearings similar to what Rodino did or what uh, my first senior moment, Sam, whoever, um, did in the Senate, uh, Sam Irvin, uh, let committee councils do the questioning so that you don't have five minutes of you know unrelated questioning, and to have hearings where everybody's under oath, you have months of hearings, impeachment hearings, you have those subpoena powers, you have a committee vote, and you never take it to, uh, to the House floor yeah. so that you're sure. not endangering uh, those people. And I'm, I'm with the Nancy Pelosi view. I don't think that the exercise of officially impeaching, when it will go nowhere in the Senate, is going to do anything but help Trump. I think Nadler is doing exactly what you're saying. I think he is. He's got subpoenas out to about 20 people. The problem is they're ignoring them. And so he's got to go to court to enforce them, which was not the case in the situation, certainly Nixon or with Clinton. Um, so I think that he is doing what you say. I think that's perfectly fine, the information gathering function. But I personally wouldn't take it to a vote because I think it would endanger seats, and I think it wouldn't go anywhere, and I think it would give Trump a talking point. But wouldn't so, it give months of, of, of hearing results that would... Yes, it will. Yeah, I think Nadler's doing that, Schiff's doing that, and Cummings is doing that. have to take it um, to We have, I'm sorry, we have to stop. We're, we have to stop at 11.15, so okay. thank, thank you, you all. Thank you for being readers. We truly appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>